side two newsweek june fourteenth nineteen seventy one contents for side two medicine theater music sports education business and finance Milton Friedman on Truth in Advertising. Wall Street by Clem Morgello. Transition. The Cities. Movies. Books. Religion. Good News at Last by Stuart Alsop. Medicine. Shock Treatment. The conventional treatment for shock, the breakdown of the circulatory system that often follows a serious accident or major surgery, is prompt administration of blood plasma and dextran, a form of glucose. For some patients, however, this treatment produces only a temporary respite. Within three days of the accident that put them into shock, they come down with a secondary complication that causes great difficulty in breathing. This is known as shock lung. It is fatal in some 15% of the cases. Now, however, a pathologist at the Duke University Medical Center has discovered that shock lung can be prevented with massive doses of a drug hitherto used cheaply to treat such minor conditions as poison ivy. Pathologist James W. Wilson began to study shock lung some 10 years ago when he was an intern in an emergency ward. Looking into the eyes of a shock patient through a microscope, he noticed hundreds of white blood cells blocking the tiny blood vessels in the membranes that cover the eye. The white blood cells are the body's first line of defense, rushing to the site of any injury to protect against infection. And Wilson wondered whether they were involved in any way in the onset of shock lung. Accordingly, he set out to study cell changes in the lungs of cats and dogs put into shock by bleeding them. Wilson found a number of changes in the animal's lungs within 90 minutes of the onset of shock. Firstly, the platelets, disc-like cells that are responsible for clotting blood, start to stick together and to the walls of blood vessels in the lungs. Once stuck, they release serotonin, a substance that constricts the blood vessels and thus exacerbates the blockage. At the same time, Wilson found, red blood cells stick to each other while the white blood cells in the lung start to swell. With their blood vessels blocked, the lungs can no longer exchange gases between the blood and the air. A further complication Wilson discovered involves the white cells. Once stuck in the blood vessels, they release the enzymes that normally fight infection. With no infection present, the enzymes attack healthy lung tissue. It is this attack that causes death from shock lung. The obvious method of forestalling these events, Wilson reasoned, would be to apply an anti-inflammatory agent. Finally, he hit upon one that seemed to fill the bill. This was methylprednisolone sodium succinate, MSS, a steroid normally used to treat poison ivy. Because MSS is metabolized very quickly, Wilson applied it intravenously and used about 17 times the dose used for poison ivy. It's a whopping big dose, he commented last week, but there's no way it can hurt a patient. Halt. The animal experiments showed that MSS acts in three ways to relieve shock lung. It lets cells survive with less oxygen than normal. It halts the release from the white blood cells of the enzymes, and it stimulates production of a substance known as a surfactant, which keeps the tiny vessels in the lung open. If applied within 90 minutes of the onset of shock, Wilson found, MSS significantly improved the animal's chances of living. After this success with animals, Wilson set up a controlled study of more than 100 human patients who had been on a heart-lung machine during surgery. Of the patients treated with MSS as soon as they were taken off the machine, Wilson reported at a shock symposium in Augusta, Michigan last week, most displayed far more normal lung tissue than did those not given the drug. If further trials bear out its promise, Wilson suggests that the steroid could become a standard treatment for shock patients, even before blood pressure is taken. 
who can be hypnotized though hypnosis is still looked upon by many laymen as an occult and suspect art the technique is finding ever broader acceptance in the medical profession at present some eight thousand doctors dentists and psychologists in the u s use hypnotism more or less regularly in their practice chiefly to relieve the pains of childbirth and dentistry there are also thousands of americans who have undergone hypnosis in the effort to give up smoking some successfully some not now research teams are studying why some people are more susceptible to hypnosis than others and a husband and wife team at stanford university has produced a statistical profile of the person who succumbs readily to the hypnotists art the researchers doctors ernest and josephine hildgard started their study some ten years ago basing some of their initial work on the fact that in general about a quarter of the population seems highly susceptible to hypnosis and that about one person in ten is completely resistant as their first task they devised a method of measuring a subject's hypnotizability now known as the stanford hypnotic susceptibility scales these involve measuring the hypnotized subjects ability to perform twelve different tasks such as opening and closing his eyes holding his arms stiff and showing age regression by writing in a childish hand scold from observing several hundred subjects it gradually became apparent to josephine hilgard that the most easily hypnotizable had similar backgrounds statistical study confirmed the impression as children she found these subjects tended frequently to use their imagination to detach themselves from reality. 